All right, friends, knowing Bob is one thing in life and able to uh, introduce him a third time is another thing. And uh, I'm uh, very honored and uh, proud that I'm friends with Bob and we keep talking offline, discuss a lot of SQL Server stuff. First time when I met Bob, I gifted him Darjeeling tea. And he, of course, loved that. I hope so. And he gave me that feedback that the tea was awesome. So next time, if you really want to be friends with someone who's incredibly talented and experienced, give them some Darjeeling tea. Okay, that was on a lighter note. Friends, um, Bob really does not need any introduction, but I have an innovative way of introducing Bob today. His bio and everything is there on the slide, but this is what I want to do now. So just give me a second. Oh, no. No, 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 Bob, hold on. Okay, here is a poll. Okay, Bob has- Oh my gosh. Bob has been working with Microsoft and SQL for the last 26 or 27 years. And I wanted, you know, when I think, okay, what was I doing 26, 27 years back? So this is 2020, 25, 26 years back, that was 94, 93 or 94 or something. And I was studying, I was in class eight or class nine, or maybe just preparing for my boards. What were you doing? Okay, so that's the poll. <laughs> Bob, did you like oh, that? Oh no, who's good? There's, you know, how many people are gonna pick that last one? I wasn't born. <laughs> that's and awesome. Then, you know, you know when, I was, when I was actually putting down these questions, I was like, okay, uh, uh, these are obvious that, okay, someone would be studying, someone would be uh, working or maybe looking for a job. And, and I, I wanted to come up with two really funny options there, uh, you know, was making marriage plans and I wasn't born. <laughs> Well, it's funny you say that because my colleague, Anna Hoffman, who you're going to see at your event here before you're over, uh, right. she one time caught me by surprise on stage and she actually was not born. Uh, she, she was born after I had started at Microsoft and she kind of caught me oh. off guard on stage one time as a, as a real funny, a funny joke. So yeah, that's, that's great. Yes, yes. Okay, so attendees, all of you should poll and the polling has completed more or less. Let me share the results for all of you to see. There you go. Bob, the results are there on the screen. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. That's good stuff. Yes, uh, indeed. In the two percent where uh, was making marriage plans, and I hope those two percent of you, I hope you got your, uh, you know, life partner and things are all well. I hope and pray. Okay. And yeah, of course, incredible. I'm going to take a screenshot of that. Satya, if you're online, just take a quick uh, screenshot of that and we'll share it with Bob later. Yes. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you for doing that. That's great. Okay. Okay, okay, then uh, we are done with this. Let me um, stop sharing the results. Okay, Bob, thank you very much for joining. So ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, Bob Ward for you. He's working as a principal architect and he's been working with SQL and Microsoft for the last 26, 27 odd years. And he's the go-to man we all look up to whenever we have you know, in-depth technical stuff with SQL Server. And it's incredible. We are honored to have him live today. Uh, Bob, over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. I Amit, mean, thank you so much for that introduction and thank all of you for supporting Admit, supporting for the organizations you have there in India, and I'm sure people all over the world probably watching this right now. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time to learn. I know everybody's in very difficult situations all over the world. I hope you're staying strong and safe with your family and doing the right things to, to keep mentally and physically strong and safe. I'm so honored I would be asked to present at this event. And let me uh, start off by sharing my screen here. Uh, let's see, let me make sure we get the right one. Uh, Amit, make sure and let me know you can see my screen. Uh, can you guys see that? Maybe it's just coming up. Uh, let's see. Share screen number two. Oh, okay, here we go. Yes, well, we can see the power. Perfect. Point. Okay, perfect. Let's start at that. So um, thanks again so much for everybody here. Let's get let's kicked off and get some some real technical learning and content in for the rest of this event. That was a great introduction by Ruchi about our technologies. If you think about the edge to the cloud, what is a common theme across everything that was just discussed for the last 15 minutes is SQL Server. The SQL Server engine powers everything that we've just been talking about. And you know, I was trying to think about what was I going to present at this event. I presented on so many different topics over the last, especially last couple of years on SQL 19, on Linux, containers, Azure SQL, you name it. Uh, I thought, you know, let me do a little different here. Let me do a presentation to this audience with a lot of demonstrations. 
less slides, more demos. And I, I decided to create a title uh, for this talk called SQL Server by Example. You know, why don't you learn more by watching someone do something versus just seeing content presented on a slide. Slides are great. I use them all the time to describe what I'm doing or talking about a, a particular topic. But I think sometimes showing demonstrations are really interesting. And sometimes you getting an opportunity to do something helps you learn more. So that's what we're going to do in the next hour. Um, I just want to point out a couple of key resources because everybody always asks me this, like, where do I get this deck? Uh, you're going to see these resources here at the bottom of the sc uh, screen here. Happy to take a screenshot of that, but here's the good news. At the very end of his presentation, my very last slide has the same resources repeated again and some other resources. So you don't have to worry too much if, if you're not seeing it right now. So the first one is where to find this deck plus slide decks I've done over the last, I don't know, 10 years are probably up there. I'm an open source presenter, so all those slides are up to you. You guys can use them and, and have at them any way you want. The second is a GitHub repo where all the demos I'm gonna do are, are being shown. In fact, I wanna pause just for a second and flip over and show you. There, this is the GitHub repo, Bob SQL. And right here under demos, you'll see a directory called SQL by example. And in SQL by example has folders. And in here is markdown to show you everything you need. So as you go through today in the next hour and watch me demonstrate these things, don't get too caught up and worry about all the details of the syntax and everything I'm doing because it's all here for you. It's all up there even right now. All the deck and all the demos are available right now. So as soon as you're done with this uh, session today or even this event, you're going to be able to go right yourself and do these things on your own. The good, other good news here is that many of these things I'm going to show you are going to be done right directly on my laptop. You can take many of these demos yourself and just put them on your laptop and try them out using SQL Server. But here's the other good news. All this stuff applies across Azure. So you can do these things in virtual machines, Azure SQL database, uh, Azure Kubernetes service. So again, if you think about the edge to cloud discussion, we're gonna do demonstrations uh, of SQL Server that can truly be done from edge to cloud. So let's go back over to the deck again and, and kind of kick things off and kind of talk about well, how are we gonna do this? You know, what kind of topics are we gonna cover? Because it is a modern data platform. SQL is not just an engine anymore. So we're first going to talk about data virtualization and SQL being a data hub. <clears throat> we're, going to, we're going to talk about containers. We're going to show you a step-by-step -step script approach to running a container and a really interesting uh, uh, property of containers and how you can patch containers different than you've ever seen SQL Server before. And then we're going to show you Kubernetes. Uh, we're actually going to go and do some scripts and show you some examples of how to deploy SQL Server and Kubernetes and find out how Kubernetes provides a built-in highly available solution for SQL Server. And then let's show some performance stuff, right? Let's show some intelligent performance capabilities of SQL Server. And finally, a really amazing story uh, of active transactions and something called accelerated database recovery. So without further ado, let's kick in and go into Data Hub. So imagine a company has SQL Server 2019 installed. But what they've got is a bunch of data sources all over their organization that they can't quite move all that data into SQL Server immediately, or maybe ever. So wouldn't it be nice to run T-SQL queries against SQL Server, and SQL Server will then take your queries against these data sources, get the results for you, and bring them back to SQL Server, and you don't even know you're accessing these data sources. You could be accessing an Oracle, a Hadoop system, HANA, another SQL, Cosmos DB, you name it, as a table in SQL Server. It's called an external table. And we call this technology Polybase. So let's turn over and see how Polybase looks. First of all, when you install Polybase on SQL 2019 on Windows, in the SQL Configuration Manager tool, you're gonna find these two services, the Polybase uh, data movement service and the Polybase engine service. We install these as separate Windows services and they're going to be responsible for interacting with these different data sources. <clears throat> now, these services get deployed in different ways in other platforms. So for example, on a big data cluster, we just do this automatically and they're running in containers in the SQL PAL environment. On Linux, they run in the SQL PAL environment and SQL Server. But in Windows, if you install Polybase as a feature, you get used to seeing these two services that are gonna be run. On a standalone Polybase node, both of these services are running. On something called a Polybase scale-out group, 
just the data movement service is running, not the engine. The engine is only required to be on the math, what's called the master node. In this case, I just have a single node poly-based system. So let's go in and see what it looks like. Like, how would you actually do this? And I'm going to use a tool called Azure Data Studio to show you how to do this. And all, again, all these scripts and all these uh, uh, examples are already on GitHub for you to look at later. Now, if you've not seen Azure Data Studio before, one of the amazing cool features of it is something called a T-SQL notebook. This is based after a concept called a Jupyter notebook. And here's what I just love about this. Look at this example here. If I just double click here, I'm looking literally at markdown text with an editor. So instead of using just a T-SQL script now with comments, you can comment into your code, your T-SQL code using markdown, including images, hyperlinks, all sorts of great stuff. Uh, you see here I'm using even headers and so forth. So I love this because when I do demonstrations, I can document uh, my T-SQL scripts by using this markdown code. And so this is an example of using Polybase to query Azure SQL database. And you're thinking to yourself, what do you mean querying Azure SQL database? Well, I'm gonna send a query to SQL Server and I'm gonna go access a table in Azure SQL database, but I'm not gonna directly connect to Azure SQL database. And let's, let's see how that works. So if you scroll down here, I do something called step zero. This is what I call my documentation step. In here is just markdown code to show you in Azure SQL, in order to run this, you need to go create a database called this name and create a table of this name. And so if you scroll down further, there's even some code in here on how to insert data into the table to show some examples. And by the way, if you've seen my demonstrations before, even when I was over in India a couple of years ago, you know I love sports teams. And so I think I remember when I was in India a few years ago, I picked on some cricket, cricket names, but uh, you know, I'll stick with my Dallas Cowboys uh, American football team in many of these examples. You'll probably get a, a chuckle out of seeing some of this. So the first step in actually executing anything uh, in Polybase is to create a master key in your database to encrypt uh, your credentials. Now, here's the thing I love about T-SQL notebooks. I'm not going to run any code. It's a demo person's dream. I can demonstrate and show you Polybase and other aspects of SQL Server without running anything. And so, how am I able to do that? That's because with T-SQL notebooks, when you execute something called a cell with code right here, we save the results in the file. So when you show somebody or you share around these notebook files, you not only get the documentation, but you get the results of what somebody ran. Imagine the amazing training opportunities you have now in your organization. You can run queries against SQL Server like DMVs or so forth, grab the results, send them off to somebody else and say, hey, that's what it's actually supposed to look like. So in this example, we're not even gonna run this. We're gonna show you that I'm gonna create a master key. That's the step one. Step two is to go in and create a database credential. Now today for Polybase, our access to these data sources like Azure only use basic authentication. That's what we have today in Polybase, but we're encrypting it with a master key. So in here, you would put in your login and password to your Azure SQL database logical server as your next step. And in this case, in SQL server, we're just storing this metadata in your database about that credential. The next step is very important. It's called a data source. Now, this is the thing you're gonna just absolutely love about Polybase. When you install SQL 19, we have built-in driver support for SQL Server, Oracle, MongoDB, and Teradata. Just built-in drivers. So you're gonna be able to access Azure SQL Database, Synapse, which is kind of like SQL, right? Or another SQL Server, because the SQL Server driver supports all of that. All you need to tell us here is the keyword SQL Server and then the location of your SQL Server. In this case, it's the URL to my Azure Logical Database Server. Again, this is just metadata being stored in SQL. Now I'm gonna come along, and it, this is not required for uh, any demonstration using Polybase, but I like to organize my objects in schemas. So I'm gonna create a schema called Azure SQL DB, and then I'm gonna come along, which is the most important step out of this, and create what's called an external table. An external table, think of it as a mapping. This is a metadata mapping to the table that exists in Azure. When I create this external table, I'm creating no data. I'm just creating metadata in SQL Server that is going to reference the table in Azure. And notice I'm using the data source that I created already for Azure Database. That points to my logical server. And my location string is the name of my database, 
the schema and the table that exist in Azure SQL Database. And here I list the columns and their types. One thing about a polybase that's really nice is you can list a subset of the columns from the remote source. You don't have to list all of them, but you must have the names accurate. So the names must be the same of the columns, but they can be in any order. Now, what's important though, is that the name of your external table can be anything you want. So when somebody's gonna query this external table, they're gonna use your name, not the name of the remote source. So think of now you being able to control the names of objects that people are accessing, um, even though the remote data source has a potentially different table name. That's different, like a link, that's different than a link server where you're always accessing the name of the remote, of the remote table. So once I create this external table, what do I do at this point? Well, well, guess what? You're gonna start querying it. We wanna be smart though. We wanna tell the query processor because when you query an external table, the query processor knows an external table. And it'd be nice if it could do things called push down. In other words, can it, when you run a query with a where clause, send off that where clause to the remote source and only get the results you want back and not scan like a million rows? Well, how would it know how to do that if there are no indexes because you're not storing any data in SQL Server? Will we allow you to create local statistics? So in this case, I can create a statistic on a remote column of that data source and keep that statistic information local to SQL Server where the query processor can use it. So if I scroll down here further, I can see that I can just run a basic scan, which will just give me back in this case, one row, or I can use a where clause. And this is where we would push the filter of that where clause to the remote data source and only bring back the results that make sense for that query. Now, that's really interesting, you may be thinking as you're looking at this demo, but what's really the power of Polybase? The Poly Powerbase is combining it with other sources. So now I can take the external table, because it just looks like a table to a, to a SQL Server user, and I can join that with local SQL Server tables. And in fact, in this case, I'm doing a union. So I can join it with a local SQL table, or I can join it with other external tables. For all intents and purposes, once you build these external tables, your users now access them like a table and don't really, you can put security, securables now on top of these tables. So effectively, I'm controlling access to Azure SQL database through SQL Server using my SQL Server security credentials. So that's an example of Azure SQL database with SQL Server, and that's the fundamental steps of setting up a polybase external table. What about something like Oracle? Well, it turns out it's gonna be almost the exact same steps as I showed you before. You need to, of course, create your Oracle database or have access to it. And in this example, I'm showing you how you might go do that with say Oracle Express. And then as you scroll down, you'll notice here that the steps are the same. You create a master key, you go ahead and create a database credential with your Oracle login and password. You would then go along and then create a data source. And notice here, I'm using the keyword Oracle. That tells SQL Server 19, hey, use that built-in driver that you've, you've got for me for Oracle. Yes, I said that right. You can access Oracle database with SQL 19 without installing any Oracle client software anymore. We maintain it, we support it, we even update it as necessary. So then I put in my Oracle host, port number if necessary to specify that source. Now I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna create an external table that's going to reference the Oracle instance scheme and table of the Oracle side. And I'm gonna create the table I wanna call it. And then I create, I have to use those same names as Oracle. And then you get into a series of mappings that you need to do. So you need to, in these particular cases, we have documentation to tell you, oh, if it's this Oracle type, use this SQL type, et cetera, et cetera. So you go down here, scroll down, and you can see I can create stats just like I did in the Azure SQL database one. I can scan it. I can use where clauses or I can join it with SQL Server data. Now, one question somebody asked me about this scenario with Oracle is how fast is this? And my first answer was it's only as fast as you accessing the Oracle system. So if you have no indexes on your Oracle remote tables, then SQL won't be any faster than you querying it with say PSQL from a client to the Oracle system. But using those local statistics give us smart information on how to push down predicates. And even we have concepts of scale out with scale out groups, where if we recognize partitions in the case of SQL Server or an Oracle system, we can use multiple SQL Server processes to go after partitions in parallel. 
So that's a great example of Oracle. I showed you Azure SQL Database. And there are other examples in the GitHub for you to look at for Cosmos, Hadoop, HANA, et cetera. One last one I thought you sh would show you would be SharePoint. And you're like, what do you mean SharePoint? How would you access a SharePoint system with Polybase? Well, it turns out with SQL Server 19 on Windows, we support ODBC drivers. So there's a company called CData, and this isn't a plug for CData. This is just a company I've, I've partnered with before. They support a wide range of ODBC, ODBC drivers. Your, your target system may have a free driver you can use, or in the case of SharePoint, there's an actual ODBC driver that they support. And so the process looks very much the same to go after SharePoint, except here is a big difference. Notice here that we're gonna use the keyword ODBC. And in this case, we're gonna use the SharePoint server's IP, and then we're gonna use a driver syntax to go after the SharePoint data, which includes a SharePoint site URL, kind of like the name of your SharePoint site. So that's gonna become kind of like your data source. Once you do that, if you use in this particular case, the CData driver, CData has documentation to show you what does this schema look like for a SharePoint list? And this is what it looks like. It looks like columns like this. And so I'm literally mapping columns to what is being referenced on a SharePoint list on a SharePoint server, or it could be actually an Office 365. And then I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna query that table just like I would a SQL table. But in this particular case, SQL servers redirecting the query through a driver to a remote SharePoint server. That is crazy stuff. So now you can go access SharePoint data through SQL Server without directly connecting uh, to the SharePoint server itself. So that is data virtualization. That's the data hub example of SQL Server. <clears throat> you can go a lot further on this. And we've had a lot of customers start to use this technology in many different ways. Keep in, keep in mind that Big Data Clusters, our new technology solution, has built-in poly-based technology, and it has similar uh, capabilities of doing exactly what I just showed you here. One of the big selling points, though, of using Big Data Clusters is Hadoop is built into the, the environment. So you're going to access Hadoop data in your own cluster. Okay, let's go back over to the deck, and let's pick up the next topic. <clears throat> so that was the Data Hub example, and again, everything is there for you in a notebook uh, fashion. And we'll be taking and looking at questions at the end of the talk here. So as you're building up questions about this, we'll certainly go through and answer these. I also want to make one quick comment, as Amit said. Um, if there are questions we can't make it by the end of my session, because we got to make sure we get on to everybody else's sessions, Amit knows me very well. I, I, I don't want anybody to have their questions unanswered. So we will make, make sure that in some way he will get me the, your questions and we'll find answers uh, post-event for you. Okay. Let's talk about containers. <clears throat> Big popular topic for a lot of people. In fact, it's interesting because uh, when Ruchi talked about uh, Edge as a huge technology for Microsoft, one of the ways we're making Edge possible is running SQL in a container. And so why are people doing this stuff? Why, what, what is the big thing about containers? Well, number one, they're portable. Uh, you can take a container image of SQL Server and you can run it anywhere a container runtime is supported which pretty much is any operating system or cloud anywhere today at all. And it's the same. It's really amazing. It's the same SQL Server image no matter where you go. And uh, in fact, Mac developers love this because now all of a sudden they can go deploy SQL containers that's the exact same code base as a Windows developer could be de deploying a SQL Server somewhere running on Windows. It's lightweight because it doesn't require an entire virtual machine to run a container. It's really just an isolated process uh, run in a particular operating system platform. It's consistent and it's a way for developers and you to start building images of databases, scripts, and tools all consistent together. And you're going to see in a second, it is this amazing story of efficient patching and downtime. A quick little tease for you. Uh, I'm going to be doing a presentation at Build coming up here in a few weeks in May, and we'll talk more about containers at Build. I'll do be doing some sessions on that, and I'll show you some interesting DevOps scenarios with containers at that event. One thing I want to point out here, it's very important for you to know, and, and it, it kind of busts some myths for a lot of people. A container is not an emulation environment. There's no abstraction layer for a container to access the host operating system. It's just a process. It's an isolated process. So in the case of SQL Server, when you run a container, it is directly accessing the host operating system. Now today, 
For SQL Server, we support containers for Linux in production. So it is true, though, that a Linux container running on Windows is going to use a virtualized environment to access that Linux host OS, whereas a container running on Linux is going to natively run in a Linux kernel environment. And we'll show you an example of what that looks like. And then the other thing you need to note here is that containers uh, can be stateless or they can be stateful. And one thing, way they can be stateful is using something called persistent storage. And we'll show you an example of what that looks like. So let's flip over and show an example of how to run a container in PowerShell on Windows of all places. So on my Windows laptop, I'm running Docker Desktop. And I wanna flip over and just show you real quick here. With Docker Desktop, when you run Docker Desktop, at least today for Windows, WSL2, which is in preview, kind of changes this slightly. But when you install Docker for Desktop, you're gonna get a virtual machine running on your laptop that inside that's running Linux. So when I run a Linux container with SQL Server, what it's really doing is running my containers inside that VM on my laptop. So just keep that in mind as you're, as you're looking through these examples. So what are the, what is the steps to run a container? Let's kind of, let's go over these and look at the, see what these look like. <clears throat> and then you'll notice that my scripts here, I give you a step-by-step -step process, step one, step two, et cetera. So let's look at step one first. So if you look at step one, type it in here, I wanna show you some of the syntax that is used to run a container. So let's get this over here. So number one, there's a program called Docker for Docker runtime containers that we're gonna use. So we're first gonna show you that. So Docker run is how you're gonna run a container. Um, in this particular case, uh, the container I'm gonna run is based on an image of SQL Server that I've already run once. Why is that significant? These container images for SQL Server exist in a place called the Microsoft Container Registry on the internet. So the very first time you run a container, if it doesn't exist yet, uh, Docker will pull that image down, a binary image to your local server or your machine. So you can do a Docker pull to pre-pull these, or when you first run them, it'll first get pulled. I've already, I've already run them to kind of save some time for this demonstration. So the next uh, a set of parameters for Docker run are environment variables. Well, for SQL Server, we need to supply an agreement to the EULA for SQL and the password for SA. You need to know here there are other environment variables because this is really SQL Server on Linux. So for example, there's an environment variable for enabling agent or supplying enterprise edition or however you wanna do this. In my example, which is really interesting here, I'm running a SQL Server image running SQL Developer Edition with Ubuntu. So it's a completely free demo environment because Docker Desktop itself is free to run on Windows. So I got my environments. And then the next thing I wanna do is put in a host name. Now, why do I need a host name? Well, a host name, as it turns out, if I supply this value inside SQL Server, we will treat that as at at server name. So we do a select at at server name, it becomes the host name. When you run SQL Server containers, you can do multiple container instances on your host environment. Well, as you might know, if you run multiple SQL servers with port 1433, they will collide. So one way to avoid that is to map ports when you run a container. So when I map port 1401 to 1433, when I start this container, SQL will really be using port 1401, not 1433. That allows me to run multiple SQL servers on this host. The next important thing I need to run, specify, is a volume. Now, why do we need to specify a volume? What this is, is a mapping. This says that when I store data in the directory var opt ms SQL, which is where SQL databases go for Linux, they will really be stored in SQL 19 volume. SQL 19 volume is just a name. But what Docker does when it sees that name, it's gonna create a directory in that Linux virtual machine running on this Windows machine. It's gonna create a separate directory that's persistent. So even if this container goes away, anything stored on var opt ms SQL, which is mapped to SQL 19 volume, it stays around. Kind of important to have SQL databases stay around if your container goes away. So that's our volume mapping. The name is just a moniker for your container name. That way I can use other Docker commands and I can use this name SQL 19 GA instead of some other ubiquitous uh, GUID or name that Docker may supply. The dash D parameter is very important. That says run this container in the background. Now what's interesting about this is that <clears throat> when you run a Docker container with SQL Server, it's literally like running SQL Server from the command line if you've ever tried that before on Windows. And so if you've ever seen that example, 
run SQL from the command line, we dump out the error log on the console. So if you didn't use the dash D, we would dump out the error log on the console of this screen. That can be helpful for debugging scenarios if you don't know, if the container doesn't start up, for example. But dash D says run in the background. And then the final parameter is the image of my container, which in this case is a SQL server image. And you'll notice here that we're using SQL 19, the GA version that runs on Ubuntu 16.04. That's the version we're gonna pick for this container example. Now you may look at this long name here and wonder, how do I know which uh, names are possible out there? Well, we document this in two different places, even though we store these containers in this registry called mcrmicrosoft.com. That's the Microsoft Container Registry. You can see these, first of all, in the Docker Hub. So the Docker Hub for SQL Server here will show you all, all the different, what are called tag names. So here's where you're gonna pick the different cumulative updates or versions of SQL that you may use, whether it's SQL 17 or SQL 19 and a different cumulative update, a version you'd like. We also support Red Hat containers in SQL 19 now. So you could pick, you could go to the Red Hat container catalog. And in here, the Red Hat container catalog also shows you the tags that can be used for Red Hat containers. So we're gonna stick with Ubuntu in our examples, but I wanna show you how you would go figure out you know, which tag goes with which cumulative update with which name, depending if you're using Ubuntu or Red Hat. All right, let's go back and let's just kick one of these off. Let's just try this. Let's go run step one of our example here to run a container. And I'm gonna kick this off, this PowerShell runs, and here's what's gonna blow your mind. I just deployed SQL Server. That's how amazingly fast a deployment is. Well, why is that? A SQL Server container is a pre-deployed version of SQL, already all done. So I just installed and ran SQL in a matter of seconds. That is one of the most amazing parts of the, uh, this container story and what a lot of people love from a development perspective or even doing demonstrations with SQL Server. So my next step is what I'd like to do is show you how to restore a database. So I'm gonna copy using this Docker command the wide world importers backup and I'm gonna copy it into the varopt MS SQL directory in the container, container being this isolated file system that goes with this image. Now, when I do that, remember, this is getting stored on that SQL 19 volume that I specified earlier. So let me go run this command. Step two, copy the container. And that's just copying the backup file in there. Now, why am I doing that? Because in step three, and I'm gonna kick step three off and I'm gonna show you what it looks like. I'd like to restore it. So let me bring up the other uh, window I have and type out what step three is doing while it's running. So step three, let's be very precise about this. It's gonna run a command called docker exec. Docker exec allows you to run another program in the same namespace as your container. In this particular case, what is that program? That program is, if you'll see here, it is SQL command. So, SQL command, it, the SQL tools are pre-deployed in our SQL server images. So I can now run SQL command inside the container itself, and I can run a T-SQL command to restore the backup that I just copied in there. And if you'll go over here and look at this, this is now finished. So now what I've done is I've started a container and I've restored a database. So that was step three. What's step four? Step four is going, we're gonna query, or run a query against that container. But what we're going to do is we're going to use SQL command on my laptop to query it. Well, how do I query it? Well, remember I told you that we map port 1401 to that default port? So I just simply need to use a syntax like this, localhost, comma, 1401. And here I'm running a query against wide world importers. And I'm also getting the version of SQL Server. So let's go run that one. And it ran, and notice we're running, indeed, the RTM version of SQL 19 Developer Edition on Ubuntu. So that's really interesting. Well, what is step five? Step five is this patching scenario. So you, you're not gonna, in a container world, you're not gonna do what you've done today in Windows, which you apply cumulative updates. You install RTM, you start applying cumulative updates to patch SQL. You don't do that with containers. What you do with containers is something very interesting. Use what I call the switch method. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna stop the current container, then we're gonna run another container 
with everything else being the same except the name, and we're gonna use the CU4 version of SQL Server. So let's kick that off. So kick off step five. I'm gonna patch, so I'm stopping one container. I'm gonna start another one using that same volume where all the system databases and the user databases exist. And that's how I'm going to update SQL Server to CU4. Now bear with me for a second because you may be asking yourself like, what is he doing here? So step six says to run another container. Now the only reason I'm doing this is to show you an example where you can run multiple containers at the same time. So this is almost the same syntax, but notice I picked a different volume name because a different drive where my databases exist. I picked a different port number and a different name for my container. In this particular case, it's still running the GA of SQL 19. So I could run a command like this to see what containers are running on my system. And now I can see that I've got one of them that has exited. Well, which one is that one? That's the one I stopped. That was the SQL 19 GA one. The GA2 one is this second instance I'm running. And the other one is the one for CU4. And you still may be looking at this going like, I'm not sure I understand how you patch this. What do you mean? Like, how can you just go do this? It's because the second SQL server for CU4 is looking at the same directory where the system databases reside. And so all of what's gonna happen is SQL is gonna start up. It sees master, it says, oh, you happen to be running the GA version of SQL 19. Well, I know how to run CU4 and cumulative updates are compatible to look at a SQL Server master from an RTM and just upgrade it on the fly. So step eight says to go in here and look at the volumes. The volumes are the shared storage of where my databases exist. Notice the SQL 19 volume. This is where the CU4 one is currently running. This is the directory inside that Linux VM in Windows where that's being stored. This is the other container, and this is the other directory where that's being stored. So what about this patching that you talked about, Bob? Is that actually working? Well, here, I'm gonna query SQL again. And notice now, the same query against the same server is moved to CU4. It's showing you an example of how you can quickly patch SQL Server in a very short period of time but you don't actually directly touch the software. You just switch to another container that happens to be running a different cumulative update. Now, that in itself is pretty cool, but wouldn't it be cool if I could roll back? Well, as it turns out, you can. Uh, SQL Server cumulative updates on the same major release are compatible with each other. So I am going to roll it back. I'm gonna kick this off. I'm gonna show you what the script looks like. So I'm gonna run this, run step 10, <clears throat> now, what did I do? I stopped the CU4 container and I started back the original container. Well, how the heck did that work? Well, one SQL stopped, another one started pointing to the same system databases. The GA version of SQL Server said, oh, I'm compatible with CU4. I just need to run a few little steps to make sure that we're back to RTM. Again, that's because you can switch back and forth between cumulative updates of the same major SQL release. So I'm gonna go move on to the next topic because you can run the rest of the story here to see what happens. Right now, SQL Server is in the middle of doing that upgrade step. So I'll just give you a tease. I'll just run this last command here, which allows me to peek inside the container. This allows me to run a shell inside what's going on in this container. And I can go to the var opt MS SQL log directory and I can type out the error log and see that it's in the middle of doing this uh, upgrade or downgrade in this particular case back to RTM. In fact, it looks like it's almost done. So I probably could go ahead and run my query right here one more time and boom, I am back now to RTM. That is truly an amazing story. And one of the really cool aspects of running containers is a new way of patching and rolling back SQL Server. Okay, let's move on to the next topic. And that next topic is Kubernetes, which is very much related to SQL Server. Now, Kubernetes um, is very much related to what we talked about and what Ruchi's talked about at the beginning of, of the keynote today, in that you heard about Azure Arc. Azure Arc is a technology coming uh, that uses Kubernetes. 
but SQL Server already works on Kubernetes. You may not have known that. SQL Server Big Data Clusters is a Kubernetes solution with SQL Server. Now, let's talk about a more fundamental concept of SQL Server, and that is a SQL Server running on Kubernetes has the ability to use built-in high availability of Kubernetes. And that is a SQL Server pod running with a container. If it has a problem, Kubernetes can recognize that. And because it's part of something called a replica set, Kubernetes can automatically start another SQL Server using a shared storage for your databases. It sounds just like a failover cluster instance, and that's exactly kind of what it feels like. So if this particular container of SQL had a problem, Kubernetes would just restart it. If the pod had a problem, SQL Server or uh, Kubernetes says, no problem, I'll start another pod pointing to the same set of databases. So it's like a small downtime to again, like a shared volume. The other thing interesting about Kubernetes is it provides something called a load balancer service. This is very common in cloud services like Azure Kubernetes service. It allows your application to point to a known fixed IP address, kind of like a listener concept. And I don't care where the SQL survives around in this environment. So for example, in this particular case, a node can be thought of like a virtual machine. If that node goes down, Kubernetes understands it needs to keep this SQL alive. And so it can actually start a SQL Server pod on a different node. But notice the load balancer is redirected to where the pod now exists on this different node. To the app, it's like a retry. SQL was running, now it's not running, now it's running again. And it looks the same to me because the databases are stored in a persistent volume storage, which again is like a shared storage environment for the SQL Server. Let's go see what that looks like. <clears throat> again, let's do some demos, uh, enough of slides. Um, so I'm gonna go over to uh, something called the Azure Cloud Shell. If you have not use the Azure Cloud Shell. If you've got an Azure account, if you've not used the Azure Cloud Shell, it is a life changer. Um, I've even done demonstrations where I've shown the Azure Cloud Shell on my phone with an Azure app on my phone. So I am looking at a built-in shell, a bash shell, that is automatically connected to Azure services like Azure Kubernetes service, which I've got deployed, but it also comes built in with all the utilities I need. So I've got an example here to show you how to run SQL Server with Kubernetes. And again, you have access to all these scripts. So you're gonna see this familiar step one, step two, et cetera process. So in Kubernetes, one of the first things I wanna do is create a namespace. A namespace allows me to organize all my Kubernetes objects into one name. And then I can destroy them and organize them that way. And I can keep my, my objects isolated from some other team. So I'm gonna create this namespace. That's the very first thing I'm gonna do. And then the next thing I'm gonna do once this namespace is created is I'm gonna go in and, and make sure I set the proper context uh, to use for my namespace. And then in order to access a SQL Server in Kubernetes, I'd, I need an SA password. Uh, we still in SQL Server containers and Kubernetes outside of big data clusters, we don't have active directory support, but that's coming very soon. So right now I'm just using basic authentication. In order to protect that, I'm gonna use something called a secret. So here, this is me, let me uh, type this out, step three. This is gonna uh, use a Kubernetes command called kubectl. Uh, and what I'm gonna do, sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. Let me back up just for a second. Um, I wanna first create that load balancer service that I talked about. And one of the things you're gonna find out from Kubernetes is you have different ways of deploying things in Kubernetes. A common program you're gonna use is called kubectl. And again, what I love about the Azure Cloud Shell is kubectl is built into the shell. But if you didn't have Azure Cloud Shell, there's a kubectl version for Mac, Linux, Windows, all sorts of versions. Now, Kubernetes is a very declarative environment. So the way I'm gonna deploy things often using kubectl is use something called a YAML file. Now let's dump out and see what this SQL load balancer YAML file looks like. And if you look at it, you're gonna find out there's a protocol to all of this. There's a language here for all of these texts and colons and things, right? Uh, this is where you wanna learn by example. You would take my examples that I'm doing and modify them. That's what I've done to go build these. Our documentation has this and Kubernetes has exact documentation on what every one of these things means. But what I recommend you do is take an example and build on top of it. 
So I'm going to build a load balancer service called MS SQL service. That's the name of it. And I'm going to map, when we need to do port mapping, I'm going to map this port to the local port of the container. And the other thing I'm going to do is very interesting. I'm going to use something called an app label or a selector in this case called MS SQL. That's going to become very handy in order to uh, associate this load balancer with the SQL Server pod. So let's go run step three, which is going to go create this load balancer. And in Azure, what this is going to do is going to go bind me a public IP address to kind of like a network adapter uh, for a Kubernetes. So let's go out here. Uh, let's see, step three. Um, create service. There we go. Okay, so it's going to create the load balancer service. And then I need to create what I told you about the SA password. That is step four. So step four is to go out here. And I don't use a YAML file in this case. I don't need to do that. I can create a secret, which is going to encrypt a password for SA. And then I can reference this secret if I want to in my environment to run my SQL container. So let's go do that. Let's run the secret. Now, uh, I told you we needed persistent volume storage for our SQL Server databases. So how do we do that? So that's really what step five is. So if you look at step five, step five is going to use another YAML file for storage. Well, Azure provides disks, as you may know, managed disks. Azure Kubernetes service uh, uh, integrates managed disks in with, this, uh, with persistent volume storage, a concept called persistent volume storage. So if you look at this storage YAML, Again, you're going to be using these examples and copying them. I'm going to create a persistent volume claim, which is kind of like a dynamic disk. I'm going to call it MS SQL data. I'm going to map it to a managed premium disk for Azure. And I'm going to make it 8 gig in size. So I'm going to go off and run that step. This is effectively going to give me a disk drive to store my SQL Server databases. So now let's look at step six. Step six is to deploy the SQL Server pod. I'm going to use another YAML file. This gets a little bit more complex. So let me just show you a couple pieces of this. So first of all, this replicas one right here says, hey, Kubernetes, always keep one of these alive. That's, uh, that's going to give me that built-in high availability I'm looking for. I'm going to give it an MS SQL app label. That's going to help me associate things with this. I'm going to go down here and notice here, I'm going to use an image of Red Hat in this case. So this is where I use my container logic. Here's my container I'm using. Notice, notice these look like environment variables that we talked about earlier and this uh, with containers. But notice in this case, the SA password is referencing this secret. I am going to mount the var optimus SQL directory and I'm going to map that to my persistent volume claim. This is very much like what I just showed you with a container. I'm mapping the directory of the SQL databases to some persistent storage outside the container. So let's go kick this off. Let's kick off, kick off step six. Again, everything's declarative. With, with, you want to be a Kubernetes programmer, it's very declarative uh, environment. So I've gone off and done this now. I have deployed a SQL Server pod with a container. It's a very asynchronous process. You notice it just finished, but it's not really done yet. So step seven says, show me different events in the system. And this is showing you what's going on in the process of creating the SQL Server pod. So step eight allows me to describe more of what's in this pod, all the different information about what containers exist in it. You're going to see when you go look at something like a big data cluster, there are multiple containers run in pods in that case. This is a very basic example uh, of just a single SQL Server. So step nine says, Hey, let me see everything to do with this deployment. Oh, let me get that here. And I'm going to show you a couple things. One, this is the, the pod that's up and running now. So I know my SQL Server container is running. Here's my load balancer, and there's my external IP address. What you're going to find is that the pod for the SQL Server deployment has a private IP address. But remember when I told you you could move around? This load balancer, this external IP, will always point to that private IP no matter what happens. So <clears throat> how do I interact with this thing? I mean, I just deployed it. It seems to be working. Uh, what can I do? Well, first of all, there's, a, there's a, a command with Kubernetes to go see what are log files involved with your pod. In this case, 
Guess what? There are error logs. That looks familiar to you. Uh, so let's go see what step 11 does. Step 11 says, well, let's go do a query against this. Well, what does this actually look like? What does a query look like against this? This is where we get a little clever. We don't want to hard code in the external IP address in our script. So we're going to use a Kubernetes command with JSON to dynamically pull out the external IP of the load balancer. We know this is the port number, but we're going to use these variables to dynamically connect and get the version of SQL Server. So let's go run this. And it'll connect to SQL, and boom, I'm running RTM. Now, what about this built-in high availability I just talked about? I was just mentioning that earlier. Like, what does that, what does that look like? So this is the example of, um, in this case, I'm going to do a shutdown with no wait to crash SQL Server. But even when I do that, you're going to find out very quickly that SQL Server is running right again. Because all Kubernetes is doing is taking the SQL Server container and restarting it. Now, what happens, though, if the pod gets, like in that diagram, if the pod gets deleted, what happens there? I can use a delete pod command to see that. First of all, I want to run this command, though. I want to run get pods. So, uh, oh, wide. Yeah, notice here the IP address right here. It says what, dot one, dot 63. So let's go and get, and let's delete the pod, okay? Which again, I'm just forcing a crash of a pod uh, just to simulate a problem. And when I do this, again, because I said I had a replica of one, SQL, uh, Kubernetes is gonna say, I need to go start another pod of this same container. And if I go look here and look at pods, you'll notice here, I've got a new IP address and a new running container. But I can use the same script that I did before to test SQL Server because I'm using the load balancer. I'm using that external IP address here. And boom, I can still connect to SQL Server. So that's the basic fundamental high availability. What we're working on in the future is to integrate availability groups with this technology so that you can do replicas and have a more robust SQL high availability solution running Kubernetes. That solution though is working today inside a big data cluster. Okay, so now we've learned about containers, we learned about Kubernetes, uh, we're getting a little bit uh, short on time. So let's talk about performance and high availability. So in SQL 19 and with Azure, we've got some amazing technologies to make things faster for you, uh, but not just about being as fast as possible. It's like being intelligent. And a couple of those technologies are intelligent query processing and lightweight query profiling. And let's look at what those examples, uh, what those look like. So let's flip back over and look at a notebook to look at intelligent query processing. So let me close out these notebooks here. Again, uh, for those out of you out there that are looking but you'd like to learn how to do more demonstrations and presentations, these notebooks will save your life because you can go demonstrate without running anything and you can still show results of something you've run. So let's bring up a notebook to show an example of intelligent query processing. Intelligent query processing, which is built into Azure and with SQL Server, is the ability for the query processor to make your application faster with almost no code changes. In fact, our goal is no code changes. And one of the most common query patterns people have seen is issues with estimations of table variables. So as you may or might not know, SQL Server and Azure SQL, before this technology, would estimate uh, the, the rows of a table variable to be one, which may be bad in some cases, right? So just by changing database compat level, <clears throat> I can actually make you faster in these scenarios. So I've got an example of a stored procedure based on wide world importers. I create a new procedure. And I'm going to use a table variable in this example. And I've got a query here after I populate data that's going to access that table variable. It's just going to do a join between the table variable and a, and a table in the database. Now, when you do joins like this, if the table variable really only has one row, a nested loops join with an outer with the table variable as the outer table is perfectly legitimate. But what if this uh, table variable had like 200,000 rows? And we estimate it only has one we may pick a suboptimal plan. So if you go run this procedure and you have the current compat level of 130, which is like SQL 16, which is where wide world importers came from. And I ran this query 25 times as fast as I could because the query itself isn't gonna take that long. 
Well, what if I ran it 25 times? How long would it take? And so if you go down here, it takes about 21 seconds to run it by default. <clears throat> so wouldn't it be cool if I scroll down here and I could just change compat level to the latest compat level of SQL Server or an Azure SQL database, the latest compat level, run the same procedure and get faster. Well, I can. I didn't make any code changes. And look at that. I can run now in eight seconds. And you're asking yourself, like, how is that even possible? Well, what's possible is something called table variable deferred compilation. Let's use Management Studio to see an example of what that really looks like. So this is that store procedure uh, in Management Studio. And if I go over here and I run this procedure in uh, compat level 130, and I look at the actual execution plan and I run it, you're gonna go over here and look at this plan and you're gonna see that what this is doing is doing a scan uh, of that table variable because it's an estimate of one row, but it's an outer table of a nested loops join. That is a poor choice in this case because it turns out that table variable has like a couple hundred thousand rows in it. So uh, what does that even look like? You know, you even notice here, by the way, notice I've got a sort spill going on. I've got a warning because I have a sort spill, which is causing even worse performance for this query. So by moving to the latest compat level, I'll scroll down here, I can run the same darn uh, stored procedure, look at the plan, and you'll notice here some very interesting properties. Number one, we are going to use still a scan, but we've estimated 200,000 rows. So we use a hash join in this case. But also notice we're using something called an adaptive join. <clears throat> this is a combination of intelligent query processing functionality all built in together. And I didn't pick a feature. I just went to the latest compat level. The query processor says, hey, by the way, if there's a lot of rows here, a hash match join is better. But if there's very few rows, I can dynamically choose a nested loops join on the fly by running the query. You'll also know something else in here. <clears throat> for the clustered index scan, we use something called batch mode for row store. That's another functionality of intel intelligent query processing. Batch mode for row store comes in scenarios where we have to scan large amounts of data. It's almost like a mini column store built inside an operator for SQL Server. So great example of us just getting a lot faster uh, for your query no code changes, <clears throat> yet we accelerated performance using intelligent query processing. So the last example for performance I want to show you was something called lightweight query profiling. And again, I want to emphasize to you, if you're seeing these examples go on my screen and you're trying to kind of put your head together, how would I run these? All of these examples are my GitHub repo. I'll show that when we go to, when we go to our Q&A part of our discussion, um, I will bring up that slide and make sure I answer all your questions, but you can see all those resources that you can run all these yourself. Okay, so what if I had a query I wanted to kick off against wide world importers like this and it started running and I went over to a DMV like this and said, okay, show me active queries. And I see here, I've got this runnable query that's kind of kicking off, probably using a lot of CP utilization. Um, how do I know if I didn't kick off this query whether this query should be killed or not. Like, where is this query in the middle of a query? By default in SQL 19 and in Azure, you have something called lightweight query profiling where we can go in at the query operator level and we can see the progress of the plan from a row count perspective. Now look here, I've got a table spool and a nested loops join with a massive row estimation count. This query is crazy going after a lot of rows and could take a very long time to complete, but I can look at it live to see that information. And in fact, if you wanted to, you could go in and look at the plan itself and say, what could be going on with this thing? Like, why is it scanning so, so much information? And notice over here, I can see the text of the query. I can go in the estimation of the plan and look at this. What is this red X here for? Well, this is showing you there is a very poor join being done based on the query that's been built by uh, the application. And so what is that? Well, if you look very carefully at this, at this text over here, in fact, I'll bring up the actual query itself. You'll notice here that I made a mistake, that I joined the same table twice. <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> so instead of joining SIL to SI, I join SI to itself and I cause this massive uh, join on, on my own table together. With a simple query mistake I made, now 
with a lightweight query profiling, I can say exactly where this query is active. I can see this is a problem. I can go kill my query and make, make a fix on the fly. This is built into SQL 19. It's built into Azure. And one other thing I should mention that's very interesting, <clears throat> one other property of this kind of technology is I also have the ability to see the, uh, for any a query that just completed, I can see the actual execution plan or a lot of people like to call it the, ex the execution plan with actual statistics. So I can compare the estimates versus actuals for any uh, plan that has just completed in its last completion state. So that's another extra feature that I don't have a demo to show here today. Uh, my friend and colleague Pedro Lopes you know, shows those kind of type things all the time. So that's intelligent query processing and lightweight query profiling. But let's end our uh, demo today with accelerated database recovery. So I'm sure all of you have been in scenarios where active transactions keep you up at night. Imagine this crazy scenario you may have seen, right? Where somebody comes in, you know, runs a transaction of a billion rows, uh, and then, uh, excuse me, runs a delete transaction of a billion rows, right? And it's this really long active transaction. And then you come in and it's, it's causing blocking problems and business outages. So you try to kill the session of that delete transaction. <clears throat> the problem is we gotta roll that back, right? So it takes forever to roll back. And so everybody's really mad because the business is still down, is trying to roll it back. You can't kill a rollback, it's gotta roll back, right? <clears throat> so a lot of people have tried to restart SQL Server thinking that's gonna magically solve the problem. And instead, this massive undo recovery kicks in and the business is down for a long period of time. Accelerate database recovery, which is a technology, and I have links here for you to go read the details uh, with a project called Constant Time Recovery is a technology using a persistent version store that makes all those things go away. It's independent of isolation levels. We still honor those. Rollback is now so fast, you can hardly catch how fast it runs. Undo recovery can run so fast, the phases of recovery may not even print out. <clears throat> and here's what's really amazing. <clears throat> Transaction log truncation is not tied to active transactions. So the log growing out of control no longer will be a problem. You have questions, I know, does it require more space? Will it affect performance? How does it work with availability groups? This white paper answers all of those details. Great information there about technical experimentations, results, data, everything you need to see it. But one thing that might help convince you that you should use this technology is it powers hyperscale. You know, Ruchi mentioned hyperscale today in your, in your keynote, right? Accelerated database recovery is one of the technologies that makes hyperscale possible and amazing. And in fact, Accelerate database recovery is on by default in Azure SQL database and managed instance. Now in SQL 19, it's not on by default because we, we're, we take a more conservative approach, but let's see a couple of examples of what it looks like. And again, let's use our notebook examples. So we go over here in the ADR directory and we see a basic example <clears throat> of Accelerate database recovery. And this is just an example that you can run yourself where I just create a database, populate a bunch of rows. And if you scroll down and see here, I go run a transaction to delete like 100,000 rows, but I keep the transaction active. So if you on your system ran this and you wanted to find out how much transaction log space is being used by this, you might find out that it's pretty high, like 91% of the log is being used. Why? Because it's an active transaction. Now I made in this particular case, this database a simple recovery database so that if you went in and tried to checkpoint the database, Oh, wait a minute, the log is still 79%. Why is that? Even though it's simple recovery. Well, that's because I still have an active transaction. I still can't truncate the log fully, right? So if you go back and roll back, it takes about 11 seconds to roll back this delete of 100,000 rows. That's fine. But if you go back and now do a checkpoint because it's simple recovery, we should free up most of the log, which is true. It's still a pain. It's still a problem. What is the answer? Well, if you turn on accelerated database recovery with an altered database option, you go in here now and you go run the same delete transaction. And then you go look at the log. Look at this. The log is, is only 20% used before a checkpoint and 7% after a checkpoint, even with an active transaction. That's because we're using a persistent version store for changes from this delete. And then if you scroll down later and you ask yourself, well, how long will this rollback take? In fact, when I, ever de when I demo this, I often tease my audience by saying, hey, how much would this take? Well, guess what? It takes less than a millisecond. That's because we have versioning. We just mark the transaction aborted. We don't have to do uh, compensation records in the transaction log. 
That's some of the basic fundamental powers of accelerator-based recovery. Now, a more complicated example involves undue recovery. So what if I had the same scenario, but I came along down here, I ran the same deletes, I did everything, but instead I go along and I checkpoint and I crash SQL Server. Well, what happens? Well, let me flip over and show you error logs just briefly as we're finishing here of what this looks like. So I'll go over to, and I've got this stored in my local directory here. When, when you run these, you will see these yourself. So let's go here to my SQL server on my local laptop. So um, in here, uh, dir error log dot star. Yeah, here we go. So this is the error log with no accelerated database recovery in it. And if you look down here, you're gonna see, we'll show you in a second, you'll see, Yeah, notice here, you're starting to see the phases of recovery. Recovery of Go Cowboys is in these phases. Do you see this? And when you scroll down here, now in this particular case, I didn't have that much data, but you can see here, recovery took some, what, almost a minute to go undo this database. This is without accelerated database recovery. So what about the transaction log, or what about the error log with accelerated database recovery? Like what if I did the same thing, but I had that option on? What did it look like? Well, when you run here and scroll down, you're gonna start looking for those phases of recovery and you're like, what's happening? And you keep looking and you keep looking and guess what? We don't even show the phases of recovery for this database. In fact, it just goes right to recovery is complete. That's because there is no undo recovery to run because we use a persistent version store. This is life changing. Uh, this can change radically your availability of your database, your RTO. Imagine availability groups now, where when you fail over, the undo portion that has to be done to bring it up online happens with the snap of your fingers. So again, technology that's really amazing. This is probably one of our big hero features that exist. And think of that edge to cloud theme. This is something that exists everywhere the SQL Server engine uh, resides. Okay. Uh, that was SQL Server by example in a lightning round. And just reminder again here, you get the deck here, of what this deck is right here. Other decks are out there as well. Get the demos of everything I just showed you right here. But look at all these other great resources. We have free training. Yes, free training on SQL workshops for SQL Server, Ground to Cloud, Azure SQL, SQL 19, Big Data Clusters, Machine Learning. It's all out there on GitHub, free for you to use. We have examples of all the different features of SQL 19 through a series of notebooks. We have 30 plus some videos on SQL 19 on YouTube you can learn from, and, and a shameless plug for a book I wrote. I wrote a book on SQL 19, it came out last November. I include a lot of examples of what I showed today. I even go deeper in containers, Kubernetes. Intelligent query processing, I have examples for everything that we have in that functionality. So that may be a book that you might wanna take a look at. Uh, but hey, Amit, what do you think? Yes, Bob, I'm all glued and there are a lot of questions. Okay, well, let's do this. Let's leave this here, but maybe I can bring up the Q&A uh, and look at here. I can moderate that for you, no problem. How much, how much time do we have to answer the questions? <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, we have all, already uh, over short time, but we should definitely take about five, uh, uh, 10 minutes okay. to answer some questions. Maybe not well, I, think I, I, think, I think I did start a little late though, right? Is that right? Yeah. You did, you did. So uh, yeah, okay. the onus is on us from you. <laughs> okay, well, let's go through a couple of these things, right? Can you create external tables with joins at different tables in the source? Absolutely, you can do that. Uh, when you create external tables, data from source down into local system. So external tables, by the way, external tables, just remember now, it's metadata. So when you talk about data being downloaded, don't think of data downloaded. Think of results being returned back to SQL Server. So... Yes, we will have to return results each time and you could cache them if you want to. Now, one thing interesting about that is in big data clusters, we have something called a data pool where you can cache uh, external table results in your own data mart uh, as kind of an, a caching type system. But yeah, we do have to go up to the results each time. Um, so do you do a remote join like link servers? We do do, uh, we don't do remote joins necessarily. But we do, we're very smart about how we join data between remote data sources. That's where the poly-based engine technology I talked about comes into play. Uh, 
Would Polybase support DB2? Absolutely, if you've got an ODBC driver for it, we would support it. You bring the driver and then we could use it. Does it to occupy any, any temporary space in SQL? There is some tempdb space required for Polybase processing, but it's not significant. And remember, we're not copying data in memory or anything like that. These are just results being processed uh, between SQL Server and Polybase. Uh, does Polybase support flat files as a source? If there, again, if there's an ODBC driver, then absolutely. Remember that Hadoop, in a way, is a flat file type system, and we definitely support Hadoop for Polybase. Um, gosh, there's a lot of questions. Let me skip down to the bottom down here. Oh, it's all Polybase. Is that right, Amit? Is, are these all the ones that are... Are these questions all Polybase based? Yes, I, I see one or two Polybase questions, but yeah, you may scroll down and there could be more uh, questions on other things like Docker. Okay, so, uh, SQL on Docker, does, does, does sometimes SQL on Docker exit immediately? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, SQL server running as a container now runs as a process like a SQL server, any SQL would. So if SQL server is exiting, uh, then go, uh, you know, go find out why SQL server, look at the error logs and find out what happened there. Somebody asked about the scripts, and I think I just showed you here on the screen where to get the scripts, right, from GitHub. The difference between live query profiling and live query statistics. Yeah, so lightweight query profiling is the ability to go look at these row counts, right, with a live plan. Uh, you can get live query statistics to get more details than just row counts, but that's going to require a little more expense, and you got to turn that on yourself through SMS uh, or through other options, but it's very similar. Um, let's see. Excel, what's the catch with what's the catch with Accelerate Database Recovery? Is version store going to sucker punch TempDB? So, uh, Angela, the version for Accelerate Database Recovery is stored in your database, not in TempDB. And again, look at that white paper for information about how much space that might take and what kind of performance you might see. Some great information there. Uh, does SQL Server on Linux support availability groups? Uh, yes, SQL Linux does support availability groups. Um, let's see here. Uh, ADR work for in-memory DBs. Uh, not sure what that is. It, is it, if it means, is it compatible with in-memory LTP? Yes. Can we roll back service packs using containers? Starting with SQL 17, we don't do service packs anymore. And that's when we started supporting containers. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but it can use to be rolled back cumulative updates. Um, is persistent version store an enterprise version feature? Accelerated database recovery, which is used as persistent version store, is in standard edition as well as enterprise edition. Would you recommend ADR as a best practice? Um, <clears throat> I highly recommend you test it and, and make sure you understand the ramifications of how much space it takes and any performance uh, impact it might have. That's why it's a database option. Um, I see links on the slide, but I can't get a full location for the link. Um, so right here, uh, as you see on my screen, just go to that link and you will go into a directory called SQL by example, and that's where the deck is. Uh, so Bob, there was a question from earlier session. Would you mind answering that one? Um, which, which one is that one? That says, uh, what is SQL Edge and how is it different from traditional SQL and Azure SQL? Oh, right here, SQL Edge, sure. Happy to talk about that. So SQL Edge is a SQL Server container. Okay, it's a containerized technology with a very lightweight version of SQL Server, like a very small footprint, because we may need to run on a device, right? Uh, but it contains the core SQL Server engine, but it also includes other technologies like time series analytics, uh, excuse me, time series functionality, plus streaming analytics. Um, so it's kind of a bundle of software that's all containerized. And here's the part that's gonna knock your socks off. It runs on ARM processors. It can run on Intel or, or on processors. So you can literally, and I've done this before myself, I've gotten a Raspberry Pi and I've installed SQL Edge running on it. So think of it as a SQL Server containerized solution with time series and streaming analytics, something that's very adapt to running Edge IoT scenarios. Does that help answer that? Absolutely, absolutely yeah. Look, look, by the way, look for more information for, uh, that we're gonna have a session at Build on that. So you guys can see more information about that. Gosh, there's so many questions. I'm, I, I don't even know if we have time to answer all of these things. So, so so. What, what I can do, Bob, is of course, uh, redirect them to our Telegram channel, pull out questions, and there are so many different forums that we have. And right. maybe compile that and send it across to you or something like that we can do. Well, I'll tell you one thing I'm committed to. If, if Amit, you send me all of these questions, I will provide you back an answer to every single one of them. Oh, 
awesome, awesome. That's and then you can share that with your entire, you know, however you share out all the results from your event, right. I, I, I will commit to you. I will answer every single one of these. Right. So, so what we can do, uh, my colleague Arti is there. Arti, why don't you give out the link of our LinkedIn forum? Because I, I hope LinkedIn is, of course, a little better there on, uh, than Facebook. So give out the link of SQL Server Geeks and Data Platform Geeks LinkedIn forum and uh, people can join and they can put their questions for Bob. We can compile it and send it across to Bob then. That's perfect. Yes. Amit, I just loved coming today, man. I'm so energized. It's pretty late here in Texas, but you know, I had a lot of fun today. I hope, you, I hope this was helpful to all of y'all. Okay, so it was and let, let people respond to it. So guys, the chat room is open now and all of you can, so did you enjoy Bob's session? If yes, uh, just give a shout out to uh, Bob and he will have a wonderful sleep hearing your feedback. <laughs> And uh, oh, everybody's so kind. Yes, and of course, um, uh, there will be once um, the room is closed, we'll give out the feedback link. It's very important that all of you give us feedback about the event and about the session so that, you know, we, uh, we always learn every day so we can make improvements. Yeah. Amit, it was such a pleasure to be here with y'all. Your entire audience is so good. Uh, there, there is such an amazing lineup that is coming. And in fact, you yourself, I see, are in this lineup uh, in, this, in the next couple of days, right? Yes, uh, absolutely. So my next session, uh, the next session is by me on SQL Server uh, Intelligence. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, I want to wish everyone, uh, wherever you are, to stay strong, stay safe, and thanks for supporting these, this event that Amit's put on. Amit, I want to just do a huge call out to yourself. Great job putting this together, and it was my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob, and thanks for joining, and thanks for the wonderful session, and wow, demo pack, overload of information. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Bob. See you soon. Take, take care. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.